Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, cultural burning. Not burning culture, uh, cultural burning. So, um, welcome to, does everyone know where we are? We've got a few little sleepers here. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Wonder what would happen if there's a fire. Uh. Um, my name's David. I've been coming to Rainbow whew, 13 years on the trot now. Uh, my country is Wiradjuri, which is Central West New South Wales. For our international visitors here and for some of our Australian visitors <laughs> from around the state and country. Um, we're here on the lands of the Jajawarang and Wadawarang peoples, represented appropriately by the lovely Beck. And I just want to say how amazing Beck is in bringing all the Indigenous inclusion, components, philosophy, ideology, programming to this great festival. So, Beck, for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Acknowledge Uncle Ben. We do have a few other panel members joining us, which is, um, they'll just, they'll drop in as, um, as we evolve. And Reese. So what we'll do is, um, we've got an hour and a half with you lovely people. Um, I'm just going to sort of uh, moderate this, which basically means I'm going to say my piece now and then shut up. <laughs> We're going to start to talk about the concepts of cultural burning and how that influences, but also meets, I guess, modern policy. Let's just put it that way. Um, and how we can, in a sense, uh, draw on these concepts and also differentiate between what cultural burning is and what it isn't, and also, I think, who owns that. So what we'll do is, um, from left to right, we'll start our little introductions, and so I'll ask you all to just to introduce yourselves, who's your mob, who you are, what your interest here is, is in this, and... Um, We'll get, take it from there. Hello, in language I say Niora. My name's Tammy and I'm a Wadawurrung woman. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge my ancestors and my elders and acknowledge the land that we're on, Jajawurrung, my sisters and my brothers and the elders here today. So, um, yeah. I might just pass it over to Beck and, um, yeah. Oh, my background. So, um, yeah, so I've worked um, in cultural heritage for about nine and a half years at the Wadawurrung Aboriginal Corporation. Uh, the past five years, I've been doing um, research and doing courses and doing um, learning about traditional burning. Um, I travelled up to Cape York... Um, about four years ago, we had some funding from the Na National Land Care Program um, and we travelled up to Cape York, up to Woodjul Woodjul and up to Mary Valley as well. And I learnt from the elders up there um, about uh, burning country and looking after country and managing the land in the way that my old people did. So from that um, learning that I learnt up there, we brought it back to Victoria and um, I've done a few burns on country. We did a burn down at Teasdale. Um, we called a, the um, project was called Windmere Younger Amala. It's a fire spirit come back. And um, I feel very honoured and proud um, to be able to do that on my country. It's something that hasn't been done for like a couple of hundred years. Because my old people, they used to burn country, manage the land and... Um, you know, they took that risk of the hot fires that um, destroys country and people and um, takes away our animals and plants. So my old people, they used to burn the country and um, in a way that it controlled and reduced the risk of those hot fires. So we did a cool burn, like um, like a sort of like a mosaic sort of a burn. And we'd burn a patch and um, we'd steer the fire with the wind and you'd burn onto the patch that you'd burnt. 
so the fire wouldn't get out of control. Now, if you had big patches of grass like real long, we'd tie the grass in knots, so then it'd stop those flare-ups of the hot burns, like the hot um, fire. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> I didn't even know that I was going to do this until about like 20 minutes ago. That's how we roll. <laughs> That's how we roll. Very good, very good. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's such a skill and an art to be able to do that. We had a, an elder from New South Wales, Uncle Rod Mason, come down and he led the burn that we did on country. He's done a couple, actually, and um, he's a fireman. So he said, you need law to put, the, put law back in order. We need wind fire and then after the fire comes a rain we need the smoke to um for those seeds to germinate um it's so important fire for healing and we all do smoking ceremonies all the time and we did one last night we had a smoking ceremony and that's all about healing country and healing our people so i feel very lucky <laughs> I might pass it on now. <laughs> yeah, do you want my fire hat? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name's uh, Beck, and I'm a Dada Wurong Pangarang woman, and I uh, also have Macedonian English Australian heritage. Um, I guess uh, I'd like to acknowledge the knowledge on this panel and my ancestors as well who cared for this country for thousands of generations before us and they utilised the, the tool, the element of fire. I guess today um, there's a lot of fear around fire and most people um, their experience of it is, is those wildfires um, and they're, they're scary, they're scary and they do a lot of damage and so there's a lot of fear. But I guess when you harness that, that power of fire, you can use it as a tool for good ways, good ways, right way burning. And this is something that we needed to know when there were no fire trucks around and you had, you're walk, walking around barefoot and you're connected with this land and you know that you need fire to help prepare it for the next generations. This country that we live in is fire prone and fire dependent. And so it's so important that we have this understanding about our relationship with fire. So yes, fire can be a destructive force, but we need to remember the balance. It's also a creative force and a healing force, as Tammy had just mentioned. Mm. And so after colonization, um, there's, there's kind of a two parts of history there. So people who had feared fire had suppressed it from happening denied it, uh, denied its right to um, to keep, keep, keep it going, to keep how we've trained this country to burn with fire and be dependent with it. When you stop that, of course everything's going to go wild and then you get lightning strikes and then you get wildfires and then you, this fear starts to develop. So... Now, when we try and do traditional burning, we have to consider that we're burning a different landscape. It's changed so much in the last 200 years for up, up a bit further. I think it's about 180, 180 years down here. And so, yeah, we might have to go up to Cape York where people still have that traditional burning knowledge where we were not allowed to practice it here. So we might have that knowledge in a, theor in a theory kind of way, but 
less so in a practical way because we're not allowed to burn our country. A lot of 80% 80, 80 of Jara country is uh, privately owned and the other parts are, you know, crown land like, like fires and uh, like, sorry, forests. And so we need to do permits. We need to follow a whole lot of regulations in order to practice our culture, practice this tradition. And that red tape can really get in the way of, uh, you know, this preventative measure. But in saying that, not all these areas were, were burnt the same way. We all have different timing, different seasons and different landscapes. And so where we have forests, perhaps they weren't always the areas that we burnt. That's what we have access to now. A lot of the farmland, these grasslands was where we would burn and, and uh, it would regenerate our food systems. So there's, there's a lot, lot we can talk about. Um, oh, I'd just like to acknowledge Annie Marilyn, who's just uh, come here. Oh, sorry, I, I just started running with this. My background is um, I've been a general firefighter with, um, with the state government, Parks Victoria, for about 10 years. And so I've worked a lot in fire suppression, wildfire control, less so in ecological burning or cultural burning until recently when I started working for our Aboriginal corporation business arm, uh, Jandak, as the Jandak We um, project officer. Now, Jandak is country and We is fire in Dada Wurrung language. So my role was to coordinate um, cultural burns with our Aboriginal burn planner, who we're hoping is still arriving here and not stuck at the gate or something. Um, and so we engaged our mob in that and um, that was really, really rewarding, gathering our mob together to once again burn our country in the right way. Not just putting, putting it out and being reactive, but actually um, lighting those fires and uh, navigating it, like, like you said, with the, with the wind. And it, there's a, a different connection that I've had. After 10 years working in fire with government, when we burnt, it was completely different and a shift happened in me. It's almost like this knowledge that our old people had is still in our, our DNA. We just have to wake it up. And by actually walking through it, with a different intention has woken that up in me and it's a beautiful healing experience for, for our people and our country alike. So um, that's my background, what I'm bringing today. I'll pass that on. I'll just pass, Uncle, Uncle Ben, I'll just pass to uh, Aunty Marilyn here. Uh, she's just um, cultural uh, ladies first. <laughs> kind of put me on the spot now, isn't it? Sorry for about being a bit late. I've been busy doing some other works on country. Um, <laughs> yeah, smoking ceremony, would you believe, using fire and smoke in a different way again and for healing in a more appropriate way for working with people. Um, yeah, so I was working actually with, with Beck um, in um, Jandak and my, or my project was with, um, as a cup of gadget, which is water and speaking for water and water and country. Um, but I had the opportunity to go out in country also to be, take, ta take part in cultural burning as an elder and to see how it really works and um, also to work with other different groups of people, traditional owner groups that were neighbours to us and to see the changes in some of those um, people who had been on country with us, burning country. Um, some I had known for a long, long, long time since our children and now adults with kids of their own and had problems of their own but once on country and burning landscape together in a, in a manner that we were in a team, it totally changed the atmosphere of who they were as peoples and how we work together. So culturally and spiritually it does a really wonderful thing for um, our groups as well. Um, so for myself as an elder being on country doing cultural burns, I was lucky enough to do the first match strike and yet when we were kids we were always told don't mess with fire. Well different thing when you're doing cultural burns it's totally totally wonderful in the way it's not um, suppressed 
and more open to what it's about as in where it's meant to be working with country and healing using smoke and for the landscape. So yeah, and I'd like to just acknowledge the panel that's here too as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is, uh, my long knife name, we call it in my country. Imachi Atle Hanskale, we're calling uh, the long knife people. And so my name is Ben Rod. I am a uh, professional archaeologist, and I'm also a tribal historic preservation officer for the Sichangu Oyate. And by saying that name to you, simply, I'm saying the burnt thigh people. They're burnt thigh people. And what that means is, or nation, is comes from a story from about 300 years ago of a fire that the people had to run through to survive. And as they ran through it, their thighs got burnt. That's how high the flames were. So that's a, <clears throat> that's a, a simple uh, addressing of, of, of how that we see fire in my country. But culturally, we are very similar to what is uh, being discussed here as far as Australia. And it's a, uh, a tool, a tool that can be used for, of course, life or death. 300 years ago, should my people have stood, they would have been swept over. But they chose to live and to run through the flames. And while they were hurt, um, damaged, they lived and they live on. And right now there's about 20,000 Sichangu. So I'm only mentioning that because it was a lightning struck fire. The lightning that struck the land that time in a story that we are, that we hold, had a purpose and there was a reason. And, but we have used fire for millennium, many millennium. We have used fire to control our land, to control the plants, the medicines, the foods, those things that allow for us to live. And I will bring up a, a few instances of that. But I also will, from an archaeological or a more disciplined in a sense of research, um, explain some a couple of other things uh, as I talk further. But for now, um, I will say my name of my father's people. My father's people are called the Potawatomi. And a lot of people look at you and say, what a, what a me? What, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> and what it means, <coughs> uh, we are the keepers of the fire, my people. And from a confederacy of three nations, and we keep the fire that is the central, the center of our confederacy and with the Ottawa and the Chippewa people. They are our relatives, and we speak a very similar language. Not exactly the same, similar. The point is, is that we keep that fire that is a binding. It is a, in that sense, not a destructive thing, or it is not something that could that we wish to put out. And it's the fire of relationship, 
of collection. So <clears throat> I wanted to explain the two tribes that I am part of and work with um, on my father's side and on my great-great-grandmother's side. So um, I do a, a vast amount of research in the, the botanical community, the zoological, the ornithological, et cetera, et cetera, all those ogicals. And to see what happens with fire and to look at the transformation that occurs to our landscapes, to our cultural landscapes, to our physical lands landscapes, our, the environmental components, parts, and pieces that create a homeland, a place of dwelling, a place of abiding, a place of maturing, a place of generational continuance, continuity. So to apply the ancestral knowledge into the disciplines that I mentioned is what we seek to do. And it brings up something else that what we device, divulge to you today, we give so in this forum for you to hold individually and to take back to your communities and to teach your children, to teach and help your families, your friends, your relatives. But Dave, our moderator, and I'm very proud of this young man. I've heard many things about him and what he does and what he has done. But he brought up a very good question here yesterday in another forum. And that is intellectual property. What we divulge and what we give, we give freely, yes. But it is not free on another level because the knowledge can only have value if it is applied, not something that is this a put in a dusty shelf of your remembrance shelving and left there. If you do not live it and become part of this land, not greater than it, not above it, but part of. That is what we are, I at least am encouraging you to do. And then that intellectual property, what we're speaking to and what we may divulge yet other panelists is something that becomes part of your doctor doctoral or your master's thesis and as something that you will get a claim and accolade for without giving homage or without giving accreditation to the people who over millenniums, hundreds, thousands of millennium, who earn this by experience, by observation, by replication. So, I want to make sure that this is understood. And if you are to apply some of the things that may be divulged here, that you do so in your life way, in your breath that you have on this earth at this time. And don't put it away. Use it. But use it without that benefit of taking without permission. So <clears throat> we just want to make sure that we, we have a, a, a foundation premise here that I hope you will understand why we are saying what we're saying. And I will go into one more aspect of that later. Not right now, but later. Thank you. Thanks, Uncle Ben. Um, so. You can probably tell um, by our dress code who is the uh, the Rainbow Serpent Fireman. 
I know I've got my red hat on, my fire hat, but it's not me. <laughs> it's Bob. Um, so just for those, uh, Bob is the uh, fire manager. Um, we've worked with Beck on country here, but also in her professional capacity too, I understand. Um, so we'll just follow with our introductions. Uh, I just want to sort of, some of the themes that you might be grabbing onto right now emerging is, you see Western philosophy, they like to break things down. They like to isolate things. And you'll see themes from indigenous knowledge the world over, and I actually think you, Uncle um, Ben, have just created a new clan, Oconology clan or something, what'd you say? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, let's get that indigenous knowledge from around the world. Um, and those themes that are from nature, of which of course we all are, how did, they, how did we know what they were doing over there and we're doing the same thing here, yeah? And these common denominators are coming through. So, um, also just on note, Uncle Bruce Pascoe will be here at two o'clock. And just what I've spoken about with all those beautiful themes, he gives you the most articulate, comprehensive, synergistic view of First Nations holistic perspective. So come and see that too, without taking too much away from this one. All right, Bob, table's yours. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I uh, appreciate the invitation to take part in the, and participate in the panel. Uh, my name is Bob Barks. I am the fire commander for the Rainbow Serpent Festival. Um, I've been in this role for five years now. Uh, and uh, whilst I'm the duty commander for the festival while it's actually in, um, in, in operation, I'm also the um, uh, senior advisor on fire safety um, and fire, sa fire preparation um, for the festival throughout the year. Um, <coughs> you'll, uh, I apologise for being late. Um, I have a number of people all trying to pull at my arms at the same time. Um, and some of those things are, uh, are, are matters which have a very high priority. So I guess in advance, whilst I'm going to keep my fingers crossed, uh, I won't have to uh, um, absent myself from the, from the panel. If I do, uh, please accept my apologies. Thanks, Bob. All right, Reese, take the floor. Good morning, everyone. Is this one good to hear? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, Thanks for the opportunity to come and talk today. Closer. Closer. Um, I'd like to thank both Jarjawarung and Wadarung communities for inviting us here and hosting us at this place. I haven't been here before and um, it's been an excellent experience to come and bring my family along and enjoy the journey. So thanks and respects to everyone in your communities for supporting us here. Uh, my my background is I'm a Warramai person from New South Wales. I grew up on the mid-north coast near Taree and Foster. And my heritage comes through my grandfather's line. And they've lived in the same place there since contact times in uh, around the 1840s, 1850s, 60s, so very early on. I've worked in Victoria now for nearly 20 years in roles to do with land, sea, water management and um, see similarities in the, the way things are managed and the way things work in New South Wales as to Victoria. So my, my job role is to connect community members, in Aboriginal community members um, through their representative bodies, whether they're um, land councils, which is common in New South Wales, or through the um, registered Aboriginal party structures of Victoria and try and find out what type of work people want to do on country and fire is a component of that and it's becoming more and more important to have the right voice from the right people on country to work with fire. So in my capacity as a government employee at the moment I try and seek funding, find the right people build a project that they want to do with the right people and try and um, employ them to be out doing the work. And that's mostly um, difficult because 
the capacity of the and capability of people isn't always matching the task or the outcome you're trying to achieve. So at times it involves training and patience and um, trust that you can get to, the, to an end point that matches the funding that you've um, sourced to start with. So um, in terms of fire and relationships with communities here, I've been involved in helping people to find training places and Tammy mentioned going to um, Cape York and I, I think that's where my fire story started as well. Uh, Travelling away to learn how to apply concepts and theories back to the place where you work. And a lot of people struggle to grasp how you can go to Cape York to learn how to burn on judge your own country. And it, that's quite a closed-minded perspective on uh, how fire is applied because it's about finding principles and systems that are similar in communities that aren't that far dissimilar and bringing the knowledge home and then remembering or learning or finding the way to apply it to your own country. So the National Indigenous Fire Workshop's been running for 11 years, initially out of Cape York and now last year near Nowra and this year it'll be hosted in June by Yorta Yorta in the Barma Forest and that's where my link to the panel is. I'm replacing Oliver Costello that couldn't make it today. Oliver, Oliver and I both sit as directors on the Fire Sticks Alliance, which is a collective of people that support community-driven fire initiatives, look for and to seek funding, and then help people to put the right fire back into their country. And that fire workshop's open to the public and it'll be in June. Um, and if you Google for Fire Sticks, you can find it on their website. Uh, they're supporting community-driven practice in Victoria. Lovely, thanks, Rhys. Um, so, we want to open this up to the floor later on, ladies and gentlemen, so, you know, um, get your thinking caps on. Um, and again, I, th I sort of think there's some themes coming up here about, uh, you know, we're, when we're all, when we're better informed, we make better decisions. I don't think anyone can argue with that. And I think, so I think what we're seeing now is this important resurgence of uh, cultural knowledge, um, information, and how we can be more proactive in managing, and I think those are some of the key themes that are coming out um, in this conversation. Um, does anyone want to sort of flow on from from um, those themes? If you're feeling that you're Tammy, <laughs> you had some really good insights. You want to share a bit more about um, some of the the practices that you that you do on country here. I mean that just just the concept of tying the grass. You know, something so simple so preventative and so important? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when we, were, when we were out there looking at country, um, what I learned is how to read country. And we always got told that if country looks sick, it needs healing. So that's where I guess, um, you know, my interest in fire began. Um, I just last year finished a study on our waters our living waters and um, throughout that project that we did we uncovered some old language we went into our um, got some research documents out and um, uncovered a story about Jinnab the cockatoo and um, I believe it's a cool and story about the yellow crested um, the sulfur crested cockatoo who carries a fire on his head so, um, you know, and through that story, um, so what happened, oh, there was a sparrowhawk and another bird, they um, fattened that cocky up and um, he passed out. So when he passed out, the other birds came along and stole the fire off his head. So <laughs> the cocky, Jinnap, as we call it in our language, he has a bald patch underneath his crest and that's where the fire burnt him. So those other birds stole that fire off him and shared it amongst the people and then the people had fire. So, you know, we use fire for cooking, we need it for survival. Um, fires are, you know, when we're reading country, we're looking at areas 
that are um, might have heaps of weeds or overpopulated with different plants. Um, so you know, we I sort of lost for words, but um, yeah, um, yeah. So we burn those types of places, but it's also for the regeneration of different plants as well. Because when, um, as I say, the white fellas <laughs> took over, they um, bought those hard hoofed animals, and it wiped out a lot of our, you know, our lilies. Our Murnong, it flattened all the ground because we had beautiful soil. We harvested our land and we really managed it well. We grew our own crops and um, we were very, very wealthy and very rich. And for Wadarung people on our country, we have a few places that we have the Zamparia grass tree that grows and it's one of the oldest trees in Australia and that's our fire plant. If you see that on country, down the bottom of that plant, um, there's a resin that comes out of the bottom of it. And in the heat, if it, it goes down, you can pick that off. It looks like, excuse me, but it looks like dog's balls. Um, so this is a resin. So we used to trade this resin all over country. And we were known as wealthy Wadarung people. But it's also the shaft of that plant. We've got one down at the Kurangla. <laughs> it's... Um, the shaft of that plant was also for fire as well. Um, and the inside of that shaft, you could actually eat the middle of that. But, um, you know, as far as women go, women and fire, we burnt our own country. We didn't wait for men to come and burn country for us. Because we, I, I do basket weaving. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us do, Aunty Maz. Yeah, does weaving. Um, so we burnt our own country. We burnt our wetlands. We always burnt around our waters first and that um, puts our ash on the ground. Then when it rains, the rain filters through the ash and it makes our water clean and healthy. So we had healthy water for our people and for our um, fish, our platypus. We had heaps of platypus in our rivers. Um, I don't know what else to say, but fire is vital and it very important for our culture. And I'm... You know, I'm wrapped like I'm part of um, the traditional, sorry, the fire knowledge holders team for Victoria. And um, there's a big mob of us and um, we've now got a strategy out for traditional fire burning. And we're also sharing our knowledge amongst all the mobs. So if my neighbour's up on Wurundjeri country, Uncle Dave Wondon, when they do burns up there, he, inv he invites me up there to, to share that knowledge and vice versa. And that's how we're going to empower Aboriginal people in Victoria to share this knowledge and burn together because um, this place needs it. And out of all of that, this is one last thing to say, um, out of all of what I've learned, I actually burn my own property. I don't get a permit, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> but, um, and it's... <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't realise that when I was doing this burning, I've got a heap of bracken fern on my country, on my block, and um, I didn't realise that that can be quite deadly. So it, I think it's a sulphur. The, when you burn it, it has like this blue flame that comes out of it, and that can actually be fatal if you breathe that in. So that's a bit of a learning that I learnt <laughs> that I didn't know when I was burning my bracken. So anyway, I'll pass it on. <laughs> wow, so... Um Fattened up cockies and dog's balls. Who would have thought you'd get that at cultural burning, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> See what I mean? It's the gift that keeps on giving. So, Bob, um, now that you've taken your fingers out of your ears, uh, can I just ask you, if we look at the sign there, it says cultural burn advocate, Bob Barks. Cultural burn advocate. What does that mean to you? And how do you, in your... I'm going to come back to one of those words that Reese said about relationships. You've been, you've been at Rainbow, you work Rainbow this site for 12 months of the year, you've, you've, you've built a relationship here with us, you know, what does that look like to you? Um, I guess that um, to answer the question, um, it's probably appropriate that I talk a little bit more about my history or my background. Um, I've been in emergency management for 40 years. Um, m most of that has been in the fire arena um, and I guess that um, 
I have grown up um, with both my knowledge base and my and my experience um, dealing with fire from uh, probably one uh, one perspective, and that's about how we put it out. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and I think that in the last probably five or six years, um, I've worked in government agencies, then I worked in the private sector, and then I've got, now I've gone back to doing uh, a mixture of both. And I think that my uh, learnings, having been a, a, a fairly re relatively senior firefighter or fire officer in, um, in m many of the campaign fires, is that um, to simply be focusing on putting fires out is a reactive process. Whereas if we were looking at some of the traditional practices, which I now have a very strong interest in, um, we are becoming proactive. As we see changes with our environment and we're experiencing we're seeing we're seeing it very clearly this year uh, with um, the intensity of fires that we're seeing in places that we wouldn't normally experience Queensland is a very good example um, we have fire services that are just throwing massive amounts of um, of resources um, unfortunately chemicals um, to actually pull fires up um, and I think that if we move from the we still will always have to have a reactive phase, but if we could concentrate more on the proactive phase, then we wouldn't see the intense fires and the devastating fires that we now see. My interest, uh, I guess, has been stemmed from my, um, my and I'm very, very fortunate and privileged to have worked very closely with, uh, with the, the mobs here. Um, and, uh, and I think that collaboratively, uh, we have um, we have got pretty much a, a quite a good formula for how we deal with fire management uh, and fire safety as a as a as a pre, as a, uh, a precursor to the Rainbow Festival on, Festival on this site. In that process, I have started to learn, and I'm continuing, and I'm probably going to come to your workshop um, about uh, about the our traditional burning techniques. I'm working in an environment now where um, at a local government level we're constantly looking at how we, um, how we minimise the threat of uncontrolled fire or wildland fire to communities um, and townships. Um, we have, uh, I've, I sit on a couple of panels where um, uh, there is a lot of talk about spraying and slashing and those sorts of things. There is I'm not, I don't know. I don't want to use the f the word fear, but I think that it's um, there is a very strong reluctance um, at those sorts of levels to embrace traditional burning. I think um, there are there, there's a bit of un, uh, unwarranted hysteria about if you go along lighting fires to people don't understand the benefit of lighting a fire to actually stop an uncontrolled fire, uh, and that's a pathway that I'm trying to um, change some attitudes and opinions in. Yeah, that's that's amazing, Bob. And um, do you bark when you say that? <laughs> Sorry, I bite too. You bark and you bite. So I'm going to just throw before we go to Uncle Ben. I'm just going to throw to Reese because um, so some key words coming out of there: manage, proactive, resourcing. Um, Reese, you introduced yourself earlier for those who have just walked in. You, in a sense, you manage that conversation, that relationship we spoke earlier about. Uh, you know, it's not just about the money, it's about sort of the resourcing. Uh, Bob just mentioned, you know, chemical management. So do you want to just give a bit more perspective from your angle about how you actually make this work? Is there examples that you would like to share? Uh, you know, when Bob's just talk, told us about the fear factor, do you do a pilot program? Do you do, you know, how does that, what does that look like to you? Yeah, well, uh so I'm not a firefighter and I'm not a, f a fire lighter for a professional purpose because I'm not on my country. That would be the role of those that are working on their own projects. I'm an enabler of projects, I suppose I'd say. Like, um, I try and seek the opportunity and then provide it where I can. And it's not my business to be writing a plan for people down here to do fire. But uh, the, way the, the way the fire workshop um, runs is that it provides the the drive the enthusiasm the content the contacts um, and then that returns home with the groups of people that go there to the to the fire workshop so in my professional capacity i work at melbourne water as a relationships manager with traditional owners the fire sticks alliance is a a volunteer role um, that involves meetings and network discussions around priorities and 
and then preparations for the fire workshop. So um, fire's my, one of my main side interests to, to my professional role. And so um, I think the, the, the idea of training people to put fires out is something that comes up a lot. So we, we don't want to train Indigenous Australians to be firefighters. We want to train them to be users of fire, to, write the, to light the right fire so that the fire they're prescribing for their country has been determined to be the best for that country. So there's no training course for that, unfortunately. The training course is how to suppress fire, how to be safe. Um, so one of the challenges for the Fire Sticks Alliance is to find an accreditation pathway to train people in burning for their country. And that has to be driven by the community that needs it to apply to each place. So that's a big challenge and there's no funding available to design or deliver these courses, but we're looking for that as a priority at the moment, hopefully to get up by June. So at least it starts with a participation certificate so that people can show that they're learning and they're, they're capable, they're able, because the, the nervousness around fire creates fear, which um, drives hot fires that have the wrong outcome on the country. So, Uncle Ben, is there anything that's um, piquing your interest in, in um, you know, this conversation that you'd like to contribute? About um, 8,000 years ago in my country, the <clears throat> if you can picture in your mind a map of, of how North America looks, and you see down here the Baja on the southern tip of California, California, and over here on the other eastern and southeastern, you see Florida and Peninsula. And then you see the coastlines uh, on the west side that are, in many instances, very straight. And the eastern seaboard. Now, if you picture that, we have a rocky, uh, the Rocky Mountain. It's a mountainous chain that comes up over about two-thirds, if we start from the east, about two-thirds across the United States. To the east of the Rockies, at one time, was a vast forest. It was huge. I mean, covering over 1,800 miles forest. If you can imagine how huge that was. However, we as native, we, we, we speak to that time because what occurred was there was starvation that was occurring in the northeastern among our relatives northeastern part of the, what you now would call the United States, or we say Kia Paha, or Kia Makad, it's a turtle land. And what we did, because we had plenty in the central portion of the United States, per se, and the plains, and what we did is we had the buffalo and so we burnt a path in cooperation together among 150, 200 different tribes. We worked together to burn a path from off the Central Plains all the way up into New York, up in the extreme northeastern part of the United States. We did this so that the buffalo would have grass and they followed it. It took, they said, one generation, only one generation for the buffalo, once the grass was established, to reach the northeastern United States, per se. So <laughs> we, we use that to assist one another. We use it as a management tool, if you want to call it that. We used it to sustain ourselves, but also to assist with the with the, uh, the zoological community, because of the ungulate being the buffalo, the other bird populations, what they transferred as far as medicines through their fecal material, what they took and 
and took to the other part of the land, our homeland, to help the other tribes. <coughs> in the northeast or northwest, on the Columbia, in the state of Washington, they used fire to control along the Columbia River, which is very, very um, a central part of their, for their sustaining of their people with the salmon. And so the salmon is an integral part of their, of their mythology, of their history, of their culture, of their songs, of their customs. And when there is too much uh, deciduous tree that grow within the riparian, they had to modify this and they used fire. Why did they use fire? Because of the bears. <laughs> There's another part of it. Because the bears would come and as they ate too much, too much salmon, their fecal material became high, which was highly acidic, damaged the landscape of the riparian. So anyway, it, they had to burn and control that to the degree that it allowed for the bears to continue to have a, to be able to come, but the people were able to then, re, of course, net the salmon, the salmon. So we utilize fire as that to sustain, and now, today, we are using fire because of the intrusive plant communities that have come from the agri agricultural community of uh, seeds that have come in and they slip through, per se. How many of you know what a tumbleweed looks like? Have you ever watched the westerns in the United States and you see the cowboy ride into town and the tumbleweed goes blowing across? No, <laughs> sorry. Uh, because those, those movies are supposed to portray 1850, 1880, whatever, whatever. The tumbleweed was introduced in 1937 in our sister state, North Dakota. It came in from the Ukraine in a bag of seed. For I, I, I forgot which seed it was. I can't remember. It was, uh, I can't remember. But it came in, and it has started to establish itself. Russian thistle is what it is called. And it quickly, very quickly spread within our landscape and our homeland. And so now we have to use fire as a tool, rather, because we, we see this as culturally appropriate, rather than using chemical. How many of you go along the, the roads here in your own, in Australia, and I don't know if they do it here, but if, if they do, the same as we do in the United States, you see them going along with torches, and they're burning the intrusive weeds, per se, and so it's a management there, and I don't know if you do that here, rather than the chemical using some type of herbicide that would control those, those intrusive weeds or those intrusive plants. Every plant has a purpose, yes. We know that as native and indigenous peoples, every single plant has a purpose. However, for every plant that may bring harm to you, there is another plant that is growing near that that is the antidote. That is nature. But when we have a plant that comes in that is alien to that environment, to that place, no, there is no antidote to it. So, we look at, the, we look at it in a sustainability of the control of our landscape so that those animals, those plants, those uh, insects, those ants, the bees, everything that relies upon those plant communities that are indigenous to that land, that they shall remain healthy, that they shall remain viable. 
Yes, I agree. Nothing is static in nature. My relative sitting here and I had a conversation about that yesterday. Nature is always in flux. So it never is static. It never stops. It's dynamic. We, as indigenous, as an aboriginal, we have to be a, a part of that sustainability and use this tool wisely in a form that will not be that fear-based. It will not be that, that which makes us afraid. We can, do, we, we can use it. We have to use it. I was looking at that hill as we're sitting here and I'm thinking of all the, all the life that's up there. And those, in that forbs and the small the shrubberies and the, and, the, and the trees, the plants. Everything that you need is there to help you. But it's how that you manage it. Because, as I said, nature is always in flux. And so we must look to the balance of it and perceive it as humans with our ability to reason and to think and to perceive. So from North America, at least, I um, wanted to impart those couple of things to you and, and um, our way of seeing preta, fire. So thank you. Binamia. Thanks, Uncle Ben. I've got to say, um, I have seen a few tumbleweeds blow through this joint. There are a couple of legs and looking a bit worse for wear, but I don't think fire is going to sort them out, Uncle. Um, so, Aunty Marilyn, you, you were just uh, picking up on some of the um, uh, things Uncle Ben was putting down, if I could use that term. I'm also going to open this up to the floor soon, and you know what I'm going to say. Does anyone have any burning questions? <laughs> so start thinking about it, as Aunty Marilyn's going to uh, give us a bit more of that concept of, so we're hearing water and fire. Well, who would have thought that those two words would be in the same sentence in an, in an alliance? Well, of course. So that's what we talk about with indigenous knowledge. It's not isolating, it's making sure that we keep everything holistic, okay? So Aunty Marilyn's gonna shed a bit more on that. Right, thanks, Dave. Um, yeah, I was just gonna share a little bit of um, thought around water in the landscape and natural water flows and floodplains, and especially along the Murray River area in Victoria, where we have a whole heap of red gum trees and over the years, they drop the, their leaves and eventually, um, the leaves build up and when floods come through we have black water and how um, invasive that is sometimes on, on um, life within the waterways, um, taking the oxygen from water for crays and fish. At the moment, um, it, well in the past we've never had those problems but more so now we have. And the other day I was talking to our local parks ranger along the riverway in Swan Hill where I live and asking about can we introduce cultural burns somewhere along the line um, because what our local government water body wanted to do was to build some kind of huge raised levee bank right around the red gum area so that when it, we put environmental water in, the water would stay in and wouldn't flow out into the rivers so there's lots and lots of different things that have happened over the years that we are now trying to find solutions to that if things would have been left naturally would have been okay. Um, yeah, so we're still working our head around how we're going to do this, but for me it's a matter of trying to fix years and years and years of neglected land, scape around the waterways and um, to clear some of the gum leaves so we don't have the tannin build up and so that water doesn't go back into the river systems and we don't have the life in the waterways that um, lack the oxygen and then die. Um, for those that don't know what tannin is, it's, it's actually um, it's built up from gum leaves and the gum leaves get thicker and thicker in, on the forest floor and it holds a lot of chemicals in it natural chemicals so in years gone by when the water is naturally flooded without dams and weirs and that blocking our natural water flows and the controls that we have over water now 
um, these would wash down and automatically they weren't a, a pest within the river systems. So the build up over the years has become quite destructive. So if you look at something like that and you look at how many years that would build up to that, which is not natural, and then that breaking down causes the black water and when the floods come through or environmental's put in, um, it runs out and then into the river systems and there's no oxygen in that. So hence you've got your fish, when your crayfish that die. And it's not a nice thing to see in the river system, just like the algae. It's invasive and the w natural water flow, so it upsets our ways. So we're trying to look at now a way of how we can burn the landscape. Um, but it'll have to be done in, in a manner that's quite precise in how we do it because the flare-up of gum leaves of that many years of build-up, which might mean probably calling our fire, I mean, um, on the road and how we can look at ways of dealing with that to formulate it so we don't have changes within our landscape that we don't really need and wasted money such as huge levy banks to try and keep black water in. Um, so we're looking at probably natural flow of water and the balance of that and getting the landscape back to how it is. So for those people that don't think, oh yeah, well let's go down the river and enjoy the riverways along the Victorian borders and New South Wales borders, when you come across the gum trees where there is a whole heap of these leaves build up, think about the natural floods that we don't have control over, that no matter what, um, that black water will flow into the water system and think about the animals. So it's an imbalance, is what I'm trying to say, and how do we get back to the reality of building something that's normal again? Yeah. So um, the moral of that is, yeah, yeah again, bringing the whole perspective, uh, Mother Nature sort of, in a sense, always finds a way, but, but we, we have to also help manage that process so those toxins don't come in. Um, and then he built up there. So look, there's a. It's, um, can I just get? A, does anyone have a question? Because I know it's, it's important. All right. So look, we we got here to one o'clock. So is the panel okay if we open up to questions? Because I think it's important to yeah. Or has anyone got any pressing that they want to share? I'm just going to go and dance in between these succulents. That's these succulents, not, not, not you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Uncle Phil. Oh, because you were on the panel yesterday. Oh, you got the yeah right. Okay. Yeah, uh, look, I'd like to commend you for, uh, for your, your participating on the panel and sharing your, your knowledge with us. I, I get a, a lot out of these things, but um, the, I've got a million and one questions, but I'll try and restrict it to one. And I think there's another conversation that's going on here, and it quite really fascinates me. Tammy, I, you, you were talking about uh, you, you actually have a relationship with fire in, a, in as much as you actually burn your property. And, and Bob, I noticed that you put your fingers in your ears when, when, when Tammy said that. There's a dynamic under here that I'm, 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 I'm wanting to sort of tease out and get your uh, perspectives on it because what, what we're actually uh, talking about here is uh, how do we interface with, with uh, the Western way of, uh, you know, a, a culture and, and, and who has the power here? Who has the authority? And, and how do we move forward together in the future? And also at the same time, uh, protect our intellectual property. Uh, because, you know, Bob, you were, sort of, you were saying that, that uh, up in Queensland, I think, or, or you're actually trying to, you're, you're actually um, uh, incorporating some of the Aboriginal perspectives into your fire fighting uh, ways, and uh, I'm I'm just wondering how you know how you honour that in in terms of uh, you know giving back to community because I would imagine by doing that you're saving a lot of money uh, by not not using pesticides and all that sort of stuff, but but uh, I'm I'm really fascinating with with the uh, the d dynamic between the Aboriginal relationship with and the Western way of of the notion of of control using fire, you know, to control fire, uh, and just just if you can have sort of some comment on that, I, I you know I'd like to uh, hear what your perspective is. Uh, but 
can we? I mean, can you get fined, for example? So, yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I could get fined. Um, so when I did the burn on my property, I did it in a small scale and I did it out of fire season. And um, yeah, I did that for myself, which I probably should have got a permit and um, <laughs> gone the right way about it. But um, what we're finding now, you know, with the, like all the traditional owners, they're under-resourced and um, we're having these conversations at my work at the moment about how we can empower or um, to get traditional owners onto country, burning country. And um, there's a lot that we have to go through. The burns that we did, we had to, um, it was guided through the um, CMA, the Catchment Management Authority. So it wasn't actually done through our corporation. We couldn't lead that burn. Um, we needed help and we had a lot of stakeholders in there to help us, the CFA, um, there was DELP and Parks Victoria. So it's, yeah, it's, it's quite difficult to actually, d to, um, for the traditional owners to do a burn. I know Beck might want to speak about Jaja Warang and where they are at the moment with their burning because they're quite, quite different to Wadarung. Is that okay if you <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, unless you wanted to say yeah. something? Um, I just, I just want to clarify something first though. I wasn't aware that you needed a permit to burn your private property. There are a lot of farmers out there that burn their properties and that's been intergenerational knowledge that they got from our people back when they were first settling on the land. Um, so I doubt the law can actually tell, you, tell farmers one thing and us another thing. I think that in a legislative way, it's just burning, burning off. Um, so I don't think you need to worry and or block your ears. Ban, uh, of course, unless it's a total fire ban, it would I, just be. I can, I can actually talk to this. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I can talk to this in in relation to what happens in Victoria. Um, in um, uh, there is legislation in place in um, most local government environments. So your council areas. Uh, they will have a, uh, a local law which um, requires you to get a permit to burn outside of the fire danger period. Um, and uh, the exception to that will be if it's on um, what we call agricultural size uh, properties or if, or if it's for agricultural purposes. But in most uh, councils, they require you to get a permit for uh, any sort of other burning on any other property. Um, during the fire danger period, there are um, requirements under the under the state's Country Fire Authority Act to get a permit to burn, um, and there are restrictions that are imposed on that. Those permits actually extend not only to anyone that wants to burn, but also for agricultural purposes. So, uh, leading into um, late February, early March, where the farmers who have harvested have stubble, they need to apply for a permit to do a stubble burn. Uh, and uh, that will stay in force until the end of the fire danger period. Um, so I can imagine exactly uh, the, the, the dilemmas that um, people face when they want to burn their own property. If I can just say two things, and one is that um, there's been a number of comments made about, uh, um, about roadside burning. We are doing, uh, that is being done in this state, um, but historically we used to do a lot of it. Um, and I don't say, when I say we, I don't mean me, and I'm not talking on behalf of any agency or any particular body, but um, from experience. So we used to do regular roadside burning. For some reason, that's the, 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 there was a decision made to stop doing that. Um, and it's only probably in the last five years that it's actually starting to, re, to be reintroduced. My personal view is that um, roadside burning should be the the primary method that we use for fire prevention because they're at, I, I think everyone would agree that at, um, at government levels now it's all about fire prevention, fire prevention, fire prevention and the onus is moving away from um, institutional uh, works and making people feel that they're more, that they're responsible for their own, uh, for, their, for their own particular situation. When we compare uh, the effects of roadside burning with the other 
tools that are used for fire prevention or fire risk mitigation, uh, which are slashing or herbicide, um, I personally am challenged by it because if we go along with herbicides and we kill everything, what we're left with is dead plant or dead vegetation, which is a fuel. If we go along with slashes and slash everything down to 100 mil, which is the recommended height to, for fire mitigation, uh, we are left with a whole lot of dead vegetation sitting on the ground. And the only way that we can get rid of it is to wait for it to, to, to decay. Um, we find that all of those programs are done shortly before the fire danger period occurs and we're basically left with, so in the hot weather, when we have the fire danger period, when our risk of fire is increased, we've actually just added to the fuel source. And I find that that's a problem. Uh, if we were to do burning, uh, whether it be traditional or, or fuel reduction burning in its other um, formats, um, I think that uh, if that was done regularly, as traditionally it was, it's always been done, uh, we would reduce the accumulation of fuels I think that we would re reduce the accumulation of the gum leaves that we have, have referred to. And if we did that as a, um, as a very regular ongoing program, the incidence of us having, uh, particularly where it's done strategically, the incidence of having these um, um, high intensity out of control bushfires would be reduced. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I just wanted to go back to what uh, your question was about <coughs> originally. Um, regarding all, all of the, uh, the barriers and the, the red tape about uh, how uh, Western way of doing fire compared with Aboriginal way of doing fire, we run into a lot of brick walls uh, trying to get that set up and um, you know, one of them, when I was doing my Jundak we role, trying to get our mob out onto the fires, uh, when they were done on public land, they had to have a um, basic f uh, wildfire awareness training, which only DELP provides. So to get our mob along to that and then receive their certificates, they can go and be uh, at the fire but they can't participate. In order to participate, you then have to go and get general uh, firefighter, fighter, general firefighter training to be able to and wear all the uniform and follow all these things. And it's and that's uh, that's hard for our mob to uh, to comprehend uh, when you come from a, a long line of of fire keepers, law holders, and um, practitioners. And all of a sudden, we need all of these things that we have to kind of beg government for a place or the training to be able to participate in that. Um, and I'm only speaking uh, on behalf of myself and my experience here because I do work for a government agency. I'm not representing any of their views on this. Um, so trying to get our mob out to country um, to do this cultural burning is... is challenging when it's on public land. All these other rules come along with it. But we did do a burn um, with the land care. Is it land care property, Nadu Hills? Yeah. So land care have been working with us too. They are very open to uh, what, what our burning techniques can do, different way of managing land. Uh, they're probably a little bit under-resourced as well and um, want to engage with us. And so we did a a cultural burn out at Nadu Hills and because that's private property um, all of our mob could come along and you know the government agency did provide a lot of safety um, equipment and um, PPE for us personal protective equipment mm -hmm. and uh, yeah <laughs> jargon um, and the fire truck CFA came out but um, you know the, I think the key points I want to talk about this is that um, in working together like this, we're, we're teaching each other. We're teaching each other that you can be too far this way with all these rules and things, which we understand um, need to be done from a, a, a government 
agency kind of way all these policies and procedures of how you know to protect people but you know our, our law is what what protected us too so you know um doing a cross-cultural awareness to our fire people in the government agencies and we're doing a, a smoking ceremony and they're like they were freaking out they're going oh my god oh my god you know you shouldn't be doing it right here and you shouldn't uh you know they were just really uneasy while we're trying to to do a smoking ceremony and teach them about it and i thought well actually this is great we'll use this now i understand you have fires they've got to be regulated they've got to be uh, you know dug in a pit like this they've got to be three meters away from a tree three me you know all of this stuff but we are very capable with fire and this is a cultural fire so um just chill out a little bit and we'll explain it because so many people have done stupid things with fire because they haven't learned about it our law uh makes people very competent in in uh just them being themselves. They've learnt about how the laws and rules around uh, safe fire, ceremonial fire, cooking fire, all these things. And so uh, we didn't really have any stupid fires, you know. Some people um, have really been careless with these things, which is why all these rules and regulations have been made. But they apply to everyone. Not everyone is silly with fire, and so that's challenging for us. Um, being, you know, and it's not a it's not a black or white thing, but us all being painted with the same brush. When there are different levels of understanding about working with fire, and so we play along by these rules. We go and do these courses so that we can actually um, continue our traditions of practicing uh, cultural fire management, and. You know, it was, it was actually a relief to just do it on public land. And um, I guess I wanted to touch on a story too. Um, as Tammy, Tammy spoke about Dinap, the cockatoo, um, we, we also have another story about the bringers of fire. And I think we have a, a really good representation for you here because a, a lot of time people think, oh, fire is men's business. Well, no. And we've got three uh, women up here who work in fire good balance but we were the first keepers of the fire the women in this story in a time of the dreaming um, there began to be too many snakes around and so Bundu had sent down the seven sisters his daughters down with their digging sticks and they were down here cracking them uh, to bring down the numbers of them and then one time one big crack and that gani, that digging stick, broke and the fire came out of there. And so they carried the fire, um, they carried the fire for a, for a long while and they protected it until Wa, the raven, the crow, had seen the smoke and was really curious. And so he came flying in, encircling it. And when he came in and he was testing it, it was originally white, so this is also the dreaming story about how Wa became black and um, burnt by the fire. And he was banished too for stealing that fire. So he's come in and picked up that burning stick and flew off with it after he tricked the seven sisters away from it. And then he's dropped that fire, that fire stick further away from country. So in this dreaming story, all of our dreaming stories, they have lessons in it. Um, and this one is obviously to, uh, to not steal, you get burnt, um, and you get banished. Bunjil banished him from that country for, for a while for doing that. But, but we also learn those lessons, like our creator beings uh, are not perfect gods, you know? They made mistakes and um, they're very human-like in that sense too. We're not perfect, we make mistakes, but we have these stories to have learnt from them. And so, in, by Wa dropping the fire stick off in other places, he taught us about cultural burning, that mosaic burning, in patch burning. So, another part of that story is, we call uh, the seven sisters Kajika, 
Kajaka is uh, the Corellas in our language. And after our burn out at Nardu Hills there, um, we come back two weeks later and, you know, we usually get the firebirds that start circling around while we do it. We didn't get any at this site, which was very interesting. The next burn we did, there was like 60 of them all flying around. But in this particular place, we came back there and the Corellas had been digging up uh, just the areas where we'd burnt. So there'd been onion grass, which is non-native, non and they never touched it before. As soon as we burnt that area, they'd come in and they'd dug up all, they've, uh, you know, lightened that soil, lifted it, turned it up, and removed this weed for us, which is a lot like our digging sticks, isn't it? How we work the land. So Kajaka had come down and turned over the soil, our, uh, yams, our yam sticks and our burning is all interrelated with this dreaming and we got to witness that because we managed to get around all the bureaucracy stopping us from practicing our fire. Oh, Beck, you just have a way of telling a beautiful story. Thank you so much. Yeah. Always so um, endearing and uh, I could listen to you read the phone book. Um, <laughs> Brother, I, I, just one little thing. I'm just yet. Yeah, we've got you. Um, just Auntie Marilyn just wants to um, uh, flow on from that a little bit, and uh, I've given her the the shot clock, and then we're going to come to you. Yeah. Thanks for being so patient. I won't be so long. I was just going to share within that red gum area along that riverway too, and along many of our riverways, we have cooking mounds, and um, they've been without fire for so long now because of many restrictions on how we use those archaeological sites that are now called but some of those are 10,000 years so that's 10,000 years of fire um, so just sort of a little bit of an indicator to think about how far back we've been using fire for how long as well all right thanks for your patience um, Russell Coit sorry <laughs> hey again um, thanks all for sharing um, my story for, well, the question I have for you is a little closer to home. I was part of, or took part in a ceremony down here with an indigenous man doing a decolonization, did you do healing workshop? And he started to do the smoke circle and was promptly sort of told by officials or managers there that if he wasn't to put it out, he would lose his, they would lose their job. So there was a lot of pressure from there coming. And I instantly sort of thought that that was quite disrespectful uh, with what we were touching on before in that the indigenous c have had thousands of years of using fire and he was obviously very versed in using that fire um, and for something like that to happen here where I feel like we're embracing indigenous cultures um, it sort of took me a bit off guard so I was just wondering if maybe someone might be able to comment on that yeah. okay so we've got five minutes okay. to go yeah thank I'll you for your question I'll handle this one quickly so uh, Bob and I have a good relationship here. For us to practice um, cultural burning and smoking uh, ceremonies here, I have to apply for a cultural fire permit. And that's, uh, yeah, I know, I know, but it's for total fire ban days where we can still have a manageable fire for ceremonial purpose only. So uh, I need to know, all my mob down in the Karangla know um, for any, any burning, any fires, uh, they need to let me know because I am the permit holder. Then I can let CFA know and then it's all good. They're okay with that. So if uh, this man had a uh, touch base with the traditional people of the area here, we could have had that sorted. Yeah. Bob, do you want to talk to that a bit? Um, yeah, just very briefly. I'm, I'm not um, uh, on this side uh, an officer of the CFA. Uh, the um, it's quite a complicated set of bureaucracy that we deal with here. But when the festival is on and leading into the festival, I am I am deemed to be the fire commander, and I'm responsible for all matters to do with fire management on the site. Um, I was um, prompted when I was thinking uh, earlier on about some comments being made. I have worked with fire and studied fire management all my life. I don't know anything else, pretty much. I have learned more in the last five years through my relationship with Rebecca and, uh, and the mob um, than I've probably learnt in 40 years. Uh, and I continue to do that. Yeah, clap I, that up. I, 
and I am one of, well, I'd like to think, I think it says up here. I'm a cultural burn advocate. I think that's a title that I, um, I am extremely humbled to um, be associated with. I am, I am a strong personal advocate of cultural burning at every level and every application. Um, I was aware, I became aware um, a couple of days ago, about, ago when some of the cultural burning was being done, smoking, um, smoking activities were being done, and that there were some people on the staff here that, uh, of the festival that were going, oh, they're burning on a total fire ban day. Uh, and I had issued a, uh, a blanket direction that there was no challenges to be made. I knew everything that was being done. That's not because of bureaucracy, that's because of a relationship of where we, that where we talk. I think that the whole issue about um, about fire, how we manage it, how we use it as a tool, and how we value it as a resource, is something that is all thrown askew at the moment because we've stopped talking. And I think we need to reopen the conversation lines across all generations, all cultures, and hopefully work together to bring um, fire back to its proper place where it is a tool and a resource that we use um, appropriately for the benefit of all. Bob, so well said. And again, I'm just going to focus on that word, the relationship word, you know. Um, it's so important. Everything starts just from a conversation and then... We all know that we've got to be champions and advocates in this space, um, and you couldn't have said it any better. So um, thank you for taking on that, that, that role, um, because it is really important. So look, we've only got a couple more minutes here. I'm just going to finish by also saying, and maybe this could be something we think about next year, is there is also an economic gain. So we all know that there is uh, you know, carbon um, offset opportunities. So when we talk about mobs up north and maybe even mobs here um, that manage lands and we have global cities very close, we're two hours away from a global city, Melbourne, that fire land management can actually be an economic resource for local mobs, either land councils or, or, or the registered Aboriginal parties. Because that sequestration, when global cities make a commitment to reduce their carbon footprint, there is a synergy in there. So that's a, that's a big topic and maybe we can look at that, that next year. Um, but I want to thank the, the panel. Uh, Uncle Ben's got 30 seconds to just thank round you. up. Thank you. In this 30 seconds, of, uh, something that, that came to my mind as we were sitting here and I was listening to the other panelists and something that Dave just said, I'm going to be probably, I'm hoping, <laughs> working toward it. In about three weeks, and John's been down there, we've been in Panama, and with the indigenous from out of South America. And right now, that carbon footprint is being exacerbated to the rate of 1.7, what is it, 1.7 million tons of carbon into the air every year. Why? Because of burning. And this is, a, this is a cultural concern to us in the north, of course, in the United States. And what is occurring in there and what is happening to our relatives and the vast, vast pharmacopoeia that exists in that Amazon basin. We, are, we, are, we're, we have to be careful of how that we look at the value of things and the corporate interests that are promoting and performing these, this action to the rate of 2,000 hectares a day. 2,000 hectares a day are burned. Uh, so we have to look from different sides of how, what we are doing as a human populace of this world, whether it's indigenous, non-native, permitted, non -permit. we have to really look at fire and what we are valuing and sustainability. So I, I'm just bringing that out right here at the last, I guess, but I was thinking about it and what is happening in the South and our part of the world. Thank you. Thanks. So keep the applause going, people, for Bob.
Reese, Uncle Ben, <laughs> Beck, Tammy, Auntie Marilyn. Not me. <laughs>